Good day, ENG 1P1. Let's continue on to section number five, which is chapter 21 to chapter 25 of the Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. But first, let's go through the questions. Again, this is a strategy that will be time-saving for you if we can just remember to do it. If you read the questions beforehand, then as you do the reading, you are prepared to find the answers. So it certainly can save you quite a bit of time. Okay, so let's take a look here at the first question. It asks you to describe Junior's Christmas. Now we said before, if there are two questions, the first question is the A. So this here is the A. And there isn't a second question. We said if there is a second question, it can be the answer to your extension. But if there isn't a second question, then you come up with your own extension. Okay, so you're, you're gonna need to describe Junior's Christmas right here. His Christmas was. Now remember, you're taking part of the question and you're putting it in your answer. And then you're gonna try to find two quotes from the text that support that answer. And then you're going to come up with your own little extension. Explain more. So again, answer, prove, extend, or explain more. Chapter 22, red versus white. What good things about his culture does Junior realize? So again, there is only one question here. So that is going to be the A. There isn't a second question, so you're going to come up with your own extension here. Junior realizes the following good things about his culture. Take part of the question, put it in your answer. Then you need quote number one and quote number two. Again, you're gonna come up with your own extension. Let's take a look here at the next few questions here. Chapter 23, wake. We all have to find our own way to say goodbye. How does Junior do this? So again, there's only one question. That means we have to come up with our own extension. Take part of the question, you put it in your answer. Junior finds his own way to say goodbye by. So what does he do? You put it right there. And then two details or quotes for support from the text, and then your own extension. Chapter 24, Valentine Hart. What happens in Mrs. Jeremy's class? Why is this so significant to Junior? So again, now we have two questions here. The first question, you're gonna answer here in the, uh, the first section. The second question, you can use as your extension. You still need to come up with two quotes to explain what happened in Mrs. Jeremy's class. Chapter 25, In Like a Lion. What happens during the game? Why does Junior cry when the game is finished? And what does he realize? So we're gonna group these two questions here together to make up your extension. And then the first question, we're gonna answer here for the answer. What happens during the game? Blank happens during the game. So again, you take part of the question, you put it in your answer. For the proof part, you need to provide two details for proof. And that's the best way to do that is through quotes, right? So quote one from the text and quote two. And then we're gonna group these questions together so that we can put an extension together. Junior cries because he realizes that. And that will take us to the end of section five. All right, let's move along to our actual study here of our novel. Chapter 21, let me just get set up here. All right, so chapter 21, and a partridge in a pear tree. When the holidays rolled around, we didn't have any money for presents. So dad did what he always does when we don't have enough money. He took what little money we did have and ran away to get drunk. Okay, so I'm giving you a hint here. This is actually the answer for question number one. He left on Christmas Eve and came back on January 2nd with an epic hangover. He just lay on his bed for hours. Hey, Dad, I said. Hey, kid, he said. I'm sorry about Christmas. It's okay, I said. 
but it wasn't okay. It was about as far from okay as you can get. If okay was Earth, then I was standing on Jupiter. I don't know why I said it was okay. For some reason, I was protecting the feelings of the man who had broken my heart yet again. So again, this is actually called the uh, abuse cycle, where the children actually start to parent the parent. Geez, I just won the silver, silver medal in the Children of Alcoholics Olympics. I got you something, he said. What? It's in my boot. I picked up one of his cowboy boots. No, the other one, he said. Inside, under the foot pad thing. I picked up the other boot and dug inside. Man, that thing smelled like booze and fear and failure. I found a wrinkled and damp $5 bill. Merry Christmas, he said. Wow. Drunk for a week? My father must have really wanted to spend those last $5. Shoot, you can buy a bottle of the worst whiskey for $5. He could have spent that five bucks and stayed drunk for another day or two. But he saved it for me. It was a beautiful and ugly thing. Thanks, Dad, I said. He was asleep. Merry Christmas, I said, and kissed him on the cheek. Let's keep going here. The next question, or the next chapter here, is red versus white. Um, and it's called, sorry, and it's chapter 22. You probably think I've fallen in love with white people and that I don't see anything good in Indians. Well, that's false. I love my big sister. I think she's double crazy and random. Ever since she moved, she sent me all these great Montana postcards, beautiful landscapes and beautiful Indians, buffalo, rivers, huge insects, great postcards. She still can't find a job and she's living in that crappy little trailer, but she's happy and working hard on her book. She made a New Year's resolution to finish her book by summertime. Her book is about hope, I guess. I think she wants me to share in her romance. I love her for that. And I love my mother and father and my grandma. Ever since I'd been at Reardon and seen how great parents do their great parenting, I realized that my folks are pretty good. Sure, my dad has a drinking problem, and my mom can be a little eccentric, but they make sacrifices for me. They worry about me. They talk to me. And best of all, they listen to me. I've learned that the worst thing a parent can do is ignore their children. And trust me, there are plenty of Reardon kids who do get ignored by their parents. There are white parents, especially fathers, who never come to the school. They don't come for their kids' games, concerts, plays, or carnivals. I'm friends with some of the white kids, and I've never met their fathers. That's absolutely freaky. On the res, you know every kid's father, mother, grandparents, dog, cat, and shoe size. I mean, yeah, Indians are screwed up but we're really close to each other. We know each other. Everybody knows everybody. But despite that fact, sorry, despite the fact that Reardon is a tiny town, people can still be strangers to each other. I've learned that white people, especially fathers, are good at hiding in plain sight. I mean, yeah, my dad would sometimes go on a, a drinking binge and be gone for a week, but those white dads can completely disappear without ever leaving the living room. They can just blend into their chairs. They become their chairs. So, okay, I'm not all goofy-eyed in love with white people, all right? Plenty of the old white guys still give me the old stink eye just for being Indian. And a lot of them think I shouldn't be in the school at all. I'm realistic, okay? I thought about these things and maybe I haven't done enough thinking, but I've done enough to know that it's better to live in Reardon than in Well Pennant. Maybe only slightly better, but from where I'm standing, slightly better 
is about the size of the Grand Canyon. And hey, do you want to know the very best thing about Reardon? It's Penelope, of course, and, and maybe Gordy. And do you want to know what the very best thing about Well Pennett? My grandmother. She was amazing. She was the most amazing person in the world. Do you want to know the very best thing about my grandmother? She was tolerant. So she put up with things, right? She not necessarily put up with them. She was patient. That's what tolerant means. And I know that's a hilarious thing to say about your grandmother. I mean, when people compliment their grandmothers, especially their Indian grandmothers, they usually say things like, my grandmother is so wise. And my grandmother is so kind. And my grandmother has seen everything. And yeah, my grandmother was smart and kind and had traveled to about a hundred different Indian reservations, but that had nothing to do with her greatness. My grandmother's greatest gift was tolerance, patience. Now, in the old days, Indians used to be forgiving of any kind of eccentricity, which is difference. People are different, they're eccentric. In fact, weird people were often celebrated Epileptics were often shamans because people just assumed that God gave seizure visions to the lucky ones. Gay people were seen as magical too. I mean, like in many cultures, men were viewed as warriors and women were viewed as caregivers. But gay people, being both male and female, were seen as both warriors and caregivers. Gay people could do anything. They were like the Swiss army knives. So that, yeah, they call us two-spirited, right? And in the culture, it was celebrated for sure. My grandmother had no use for all the gay bashing and homophobia in the world, especially among other Indians. Geez, she said, who cares if a man wants to marry another man? All I wanna know is who's gonna pick up all the dirty socks. <laughs> of course, ever since white people showed up and brought along their Christianity and their fears of eccentricity, difference, right? People who are different. Indians have gradually lost all of their tolerance, patience, and understanding, yeah. Indians can be just as judgmental and hateful as any white person, but not my grandmother. She still hung on to that old-time Indian spirit, you know? She always approached each new person and each new experience the exact same way. Whenever we went to Spokane, my grandmother would talk to anybody, even the homeless people, even the homeless guys we were talking to, invisible people. My grandmother would start talking to the invisible people too. Why would she do that? Well, she said, how can I be sure there aren't invisible people in the world? Scientists didn't believe in the mountain gorilla for hundreds of years, and now look, so if scientists, scientists can be wrong, then all of us can be wrong. I mean, what if all those invisible people are scientists? <laughs> Think about that one. So I thought about that one. Of course, draws a little cartoon about it. After I decided to go to Reardon, I felt like an invisible mountain gorilla scientist. My grandmother was the only one who thought it was 100% a good idea. Think of all the new people you're going to meet, she said. That's the whole point of life, you know, to meet new people. I wish I could go with you. It's such an exciting idea. Of course, my grandmother had met thousands, tens of thousands of other Indians at powwows and all over the country. Every powwow Indian knew her. Now, just remember this part because a little bit later on in, uh, in the novel, we're going to refer back to this, how she knew so many different Indigenous people from all over the country. Yep, my grandmother was powwow famous. Everybody loved her and she loved everybody. In fact, last week, she was walking home from a mini powwow at the Spokane Tribal Community Center when she was struck and killed by a drunk driver. Yeah, you read that right. She didn't die right away. The reservation paramedics kept her alive long enough to get to the hospital in Spokane, but 
She died during emergency surgery. Massive internal injuries. At the hospital, my mother wept and wailed. She lost her mother. When anybody, no matter how old they are, loses a parent, I think it hurts the same as if you were only five years old, you know? I think all of us were always five years old in the presence and absence of our parents. My father was all quiet and serious with the surgeon, a big and handsome white guy. Did she say anything before she died? He asked. Yes, the surgeon said. She said, forgive him. Forgive him? My father asked. I, I think she was referring to the drunk driver who killed her. Wow. My grandmother's last act on earth was a call for forgiveness, love, and tolerance. She wanted us to forgive Gerald, the dumbass Spokane Indian alcoholic who ran her over and killed her. I think my dad wanted to go find Gerald and beat him to death. I think my mother would have helped him. I think I would have helped him too. But my grandmother wanted us to forgive her murderer. Even dead, she was a better person than us. The tribal cops found Gerald hiding out at Benjamin Lake and they took him to jail. And after we got back from the hospital, my father went over to see Gerald to kill him or forgive him. I think the tribal cops might have looked the other way if my father had decided to strangle Gerald. But my father, respecting my grandmother's last wishes, left Gerald alone to the justice system, which ended up sending him to prison for 18 months. What? You kill somebody and you get 18 months? After he got out, Gerald moved to a reservation in California and nobody ever saw him again. But my family had to bury my grandmother. I mean, it's natural to bury your grandmother. Your grandparents are supposed to die first, but they're supposed to die of old age. They're not, sorry, they're supposed to die of a heart attack or a stroke or of cancer or of Alzheimer's. They are not supposed to get run over and killed by a drunk driver. I mean, the thing is, plenty of Indians have died because they were drunk. And plenty of drunken Indians have killed other drunken Indians. But my grandmother had never drunk alcohol in her life. Not one drop. That's the rarest kind of Indian in the world. I know only like five Indians in our whole tribe who have never drunk alcohol. And my grandmother was one of them. Drinking would shut down my seeing and my hearing and my feeling, she used to say. Why would I want to be in the world if I couldn't touch the world with all of my senses intact? Well, my grandmother has left this world and she's now roaming around the afterlife. Chapter 23, Wake. We held grandmother's wake three days later. We knew that people would be coming in large numbers, but we were stunned because almost 2,000 Indians showed up that day to say goodbye. And nobody gave me any crap. I mean, I was still the kid who had betrayed the tribe and that couldn't be forgiven. But I was also the kid who'd lost his grandmother. And everybody knew that losing my grandmother was horrible. And they all waved the white flag that day and let me grieve in peace. Remember, he was part of the Black Eye of the Month Club, right? So he would get beat up quite a bit, quite a bit. So, but at this time, during the funeral, nobody, nobody gave him any crap. And after that, they stopped hassling me whenever they saw me on the res. I mean, I still lived on the res, right? And I had to go get the mail and get milk from the trading post and just hang out, right? So I was still a part of the res. 
People had either ignored me or called me names or pushed me, but they stopped after my grandmother died. I guess they realized that I was in enough pain already. Or maybe they realized they'd been cruel jerks. I, I wasn't suddenly popular, of course, but I wasn't a villain anymore. No matter what else happened between my tribe and me, I would always love them for giving me peace on the day of my grandmother's funeral. Even Rowdy just stood far away. He would always be my best friend, no matter how much he hated me. We had to move the coffin out of the Spokane Tribal Longhouse and set it on the 50-yard line of the football field. There were so many people who came. We were lucky the weather was good. Yep, about 2,000 Indians and a few white folks sat and stood on the football field as we all said goodbye to the greatest Spokane Indian in history. I knew that my grandmother would have loved that send-off. It was crazy and fun and sad. My sister wasn't able, able to come to the funeral. That was the worst part about it. She didn't have enough money to get back, I guess. That was sad. But she promised me she'd sing 100 morning songs that day. Morning means you're grieving, you're sad. We all have to find our own way to say goodbye. So here's another question, right? So remember, how does, the question is, um, how does Junior learn to say goodbye in his own way? Tons of people told stories about my grandmother, but there was one story that mattered most of all. About 10 hours into the wake, a white guy stood. He was a stranger. He looked vaguely familiar, kind of familiar. I, I knew I'd seen him before, but I couldn't think of where. We all wondered exactly who he was but nobody knew. That wasn't surprising. My grandmother had met thousands of people. The white guy was holding this big suitcase. He held that thing tight to his chest as he talked. Hello, he said, my name is Ted. And then I remembered who he was. He was a rich and famous billionaire white dude. He was famous for being filthy rich and really weird. My grandmother knew Billionaire Ted? Wow. We all were excited to hear this guy's story. And so what did he have to say? So let's take a look at this guy. Um, I'm not Indian, but I feel Indian in my bones. <laughs> People say this all the time about different, um, different ethnicities. Why do these balding guys always have ponytails? Turquoise ring on every other finger, probably $500 to $1,000 each, super rich. Um, sacred leather scrotum sheath purchased from Navajo shaman for $1,000. Actually, a Kmart Naga hide baby booty purchased by Navajo common for $3.99. American Heritage um, Pendleton jacket purchased online for $900. Fringed buckskin pants, purposefully, uh, purportedly worn by Geronimo, $150,000 from a private collector. And U.S. cavalry boots worn by Kevin Costner in Dances with Wolves, purchased on eBay for $3,000. So he's making this up, right? He, this is what Junior interprets him, you know, to, to, to be. Wait, uh, sorry, we all groaned. We expected, we'd expected this guy to be original, but he was yet another white guy who showed up on the res because he loved Indian people so much. Do you know how many white strangers show up on Indian reservations every year and start telling Indians how much they love them? Thousands. It's sickening and boring. Listen, Ted said, I know you've heard that before. I know white people say that all the time, but I still need to say it. I love Indians. I love your songs, your dances, and your souls. And I love your art. I collect Indian art. Oh God, he was a collector. Those guys made Indians feel like insects pinned on a display board. I looked around the football field. Yep, all my cousins were squirming like 
uh, beetles and butterflies with pins stuck in their hearts. I've collected Indian art for decades, Ted said. I have old spears, old arrowheads, and I have old armor, armor, like to wear in battle. I have blankets and paintings and sculptures and baskets and jewelry, blah, blah, blah. And I have old powwow dance outfits, he said. Now that made everybody sit up and pay attention because of course, grandma was a famous powwow dancer. About 10 years ago, this Indian guy knocked on the door of my cabin in Montana. Cabin my butt. Ted lived in a 40 room log mansion just outside of Bozeman. Well, I didn't know the stranger, as Ted said, but I always opened my door to Indians. Oh, please. <laughs> and this particular Indian stranger was holding a very beautiful powwow dance outfit, a woman's powwow dance outfit. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It was all beaded blue and red and yellow with a Thunderbird design. It must have weighed 50 pounds. And I couldn't imagine the strength of the woman who could dance beneath that magical burden. Every woman in the world could dance that way. Well, this Indian stranger said he was in, des in a desperate situation. His wife was dying of cancer and he needed money to pay for her medicine. I knew he was lying. I knew he'd stolen the outfit. I could always smell a thief, he said. Smell yourself, Ted. <laughs> So they're not, they're not really that impressed with him. <laughs> yeah, they're not really that impressed with Ted. And I knew I should call the police on this thief. I knew I should take that outfit away and find the real owner. But it was so beautiful, so perfect, that I gave the Indian stranger a thousand dollars and sent him on his way. And I kept the outfit. Whoa, <sighs> Ted was coming here to make a confession? And why had he chosen my grandmother's funeral for his confession? For years, Ted said, I felt terrible. I'd look at that outfit hanging on the wall of my Montana cabin. Mansion, Ted, it's a mansion. Go ahead, you can say it, mansion. And then I decided to do some research. I hired an anthropologist, an expert, and he quickly pointed out that the, that the outfit was obviously of interior Salish origin. And after doing a little research, he discovered that the outfit was Spokane Indian, to be specific. And then a few years ago, we visited your reservation undercover and learned that this stolen outfit once belonged to a woman named Grandmother Spirit. We all gasped. This was a huge shock. I wondered if we were all part of some crazy reality show called When Billionaires Pretend to be Human. I looked around for the cameras. Well, ever since I learned who really owned this outfit, I've been torn. I always wanted to give it back, but I wanted to keep it too. I couldn't sleep some nights because I was so torn up by it. Okay, so they did all this research. Um, the question is, does this powwow outfit, or did it, actually belong to Grandmother Spirit? It appears that it did. All right, so so... What do you think? Just ask yourself that question. Do we believe that it really did belong to Grandmother Spirit? Hmm. Yeah, even billionaires have dark nights of the soul. So living in some regret from his conscience. And well, I finally couldn't take it anymore. I packed up the outfit and headed for your reservation. So this is the Ted guy talking. Here, to hand deliver the outfit back to Grandmother Spirit. And I get here? only to discover that she's passed on to the next world. It's just devastating. Now what this guy is doing is he's taking this opportunity to make her funeral about him. That is not respectful. So people are not gonna be impressed with him trying to do this, right? It's her reserve, it's her, sorry, her, her funeral. Um, and he's kind of stealing the spotlight here to make himself feel less guilty. It's disrespectful. We were all completely silent. This was the weirdest thing any of us had ever witnessed. And we're Indians. So trust me, we've had some, we've seen some really weird stuff. But I have the outfit here, Ted said. 
He opened up a suitcase and pulled out the outfit and held it up. It was 50 pounds, so he struggled with it. Anybody would have struggled with it. So if any of Grandmother Spirit's children are here, I'd love to return her outfit to them. My mother stood and walked up to Ted. I'm Grandmother Spirit's only daughter, she said. Now, we're going to try to predict how she's going to react. This whole showing up at the funeral and making the funeral kind of about him and wanting to have like a confession and be forgiven, it, it is kind of disrespectful. So I wonder how Junior's mom is going to react here. My mother's voice had gotten all formal. <laughs> Indians are good at that. We'll be talking and laughing and carrying on like normal and then boom, we get all serious and sacred and start talking like some English royalty. Dearest daughter, Ted said, I hereby return your stolen goods. I hope you forgive me for returning it too late. So again, he's making this opportunity about him. All the focus is on him when that's disrespectful at a funeral. You put the, the person who has passed um, as the focus of attention. Well, there's nothing to forgive, Ted, my mother said. A grandmother spirit wasn't a powwow dancer. Ted's mouth dropped open. Now we know that that's not true. She's lying, right? Ted's mouth dropped open. Excuse me, he said. My mother loved going to powwows, but she never danced. She never owned a dance outfit. This couldn't be hers. Ted didn't say anything. He couldn't say anything. In fact, looking at the beads and design, this doesn't look spoken at all. I don't recognize the work. Does anybody here recognize the beadwork? No, everybody said. It looks more Sue to me, my mother said. Maybe Oglala, maybe. I'm not an expert. Your anthropologist wasn't much of an expert either. He got this way wrong. So she's mocking him, making fun of him. We all just sat there in silence as Ted mulled this over. Then he packed his outfit back into the suitcase, hurried over to his waiting car and sped away. For about two minutes, we all sat quiet. Who knew what to say? And then my mother started laughing. And that set us all off. 2,000 Indians laughed at the same time. We kept laughing. It was the most glorious noise I'd ever heard. And I realized that, sure, Indians were drunk and sad and displaced and crazy and mean, but dang, we knew how to laugh. When it comes to death, we know that laughter and tears are pretty much the same thing. It's a good way to get all your emotions out, right? And so, laughing and crying, we said goodbye to grandmother, to my grandmother. And when we said goodbye to one grandmother, we said goodbye to all of them. Each funeral was a funeral for all of us. Yeah, to remind us that we need to um, make our lives a priority so that when we die, we don't have any regrets. We lived and died together. So question three right here. All of us laughed when they lowered my grandmother into the ground. And all of us laughed when they covered her with dirt. And all of us laughed as we walked and drove and rode our way back to our lonely, lonely houses. So how does Junior learn to have his own way to say goodbye? Well, like the rest of the Indians here, he learns to laugh and let out a lot of that emotion, all of that pent up sadness and anger. So that's how he learns to say goodbye. And here is his representation, his cartoon, of what's waiting for his grandmother when she gets there. Heaven, welcome grandmother spirit. Heaven, I'm here, we're open. Um, if I'm not here, we're closed. Harp lessons, sweet in the sky and three easy steps. Wings, new and used. Uh, sing along with me, never kissed by an angel, Elvis. Um, have that coveted uh, Elvis sighting. 
Sale, disposable halos, cheap and convenient. Joe loves Marilyn. So again, let's see, he's making this kind of a funny um, experience, right? So he's learning to deal with all of his sadness. He learns to say goodbye by, um, by laughing, by getting it out, finding something funny to get through all of the intense, incredible sadness. Yeah. Chapter 24, Valentine Hart. A few days after I gave Penelope a homemade Valentine, and she said she forgot it was Valentine's Day, my dad's best friend Eugene was shot in the face in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven in Spokane. Way drunk, Eugene was shot and killed by one of his good friends, Bobby, who was too drunk to even remember pulling the trigger. The police think Eugene and Bobby fought over the last drink and a bottle of wine. This is hugely tragic. Do things like this happen all the time? For sure they do. Because when people get drunk, it brings out anger in some people and they don't know what they're doing. So great, great, great tragedy often happens. So again, here is Junior's representation of how that happened. How to get the last sip of wine from the bottom of a bottle with love. You're my best friend. Aw. With guilt. You always get the last sip. Aw. With reverse psychology. I didn't want it anyway. Oh, well, go ahead. Sacred tradition. You must respect your elders. Yes, sir. Or with force. Bang. Pulls out a gun. So again, this is, just remember, this is happening in the United States. There are, of course, um, indigenous tribes that are from the United States as well. And because they're in the United States, they have much easier access to firearms, right? When Bobby was sober enough to realize what he'd done, can you imagine this moment? You killed your best friend and you're so drunk you don't even remember it. He could only call Eugene's name over and over as if that would somehow bring him back. Oh, personal tragedy here. This is so much intense personal tragedy. How, how could you possibly deal with it all? A few weeks later, in jail, Bobby hung himself with a bed sheet. We didn't even have enough time to forgive him. He punished himself for his sins. Whew. My father went on a legendary drinking binge. Again, remember, Eugene was his best friend. My mother went to church every single day. It was all booze and God, booze and God, booze and God. We'd lost my grandmother and Eugene. How much loss were we supposed to endure? I felt helpless and stupid. I needed books. I wanted books. So again, books take him away from his challenging, challenging life. And I drew and drew and drew cartoons. I was mad at God. I was mad at Jesus. They were mocking me, so I mocked them. Yeah, so he, he's not sure what to do with all of his incredible anger. Not only that, it's important here to note that very, very, very likely he's suffering from PTSD, right? Post-traumatic, um, that post-traumatic PTSD. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. So every time you encounter some kind of a traumatic, huge traumatic situation, you it 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 does something to your body and to the and to the um, the feel-good hormones like serotonin and dopamine. And my understanding is that these the serotonin and the dopamine um, get kind of thrown out of whack, and that makes you experience certain real physical um, symptoms. For example, people get forgetful, they feel numb, like they can't feel anything. And the more and more you, you experience traumatic um, situations, the more and more you can just become like chronically in PTSD. So feeling numb, not feeling anything, right? And of course you get flashbacks and there's other things involved with that. But with all of this, this tragic, traumatic death, 
I bet you all these people are going through PTSD. Absolutely. Poor memory, all of it. I hoped I could find more cartoons that would help me, and I hoped I could find stories that would help me. So I looked up the word grief in the dictionary. So I wanted to find out everything I could about grief. I wanted to know why my family had been given so much to grieve about. And then I discovered the answer, grief. When you feel so helpless and stupid that you think nothing will ever be right again and your macaroni and cheese tastes like sawdust and you can't even jerk off because it seems like too much trouble. So again, this is, some people may find this very offensive, right? And many parents have. However, again, I'm gonna point out, this is the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian who is of course a teenage boy. Um, so is he being absolutely true? He very well might be. All right. So in, in like, in, in total, essentially what he's saying is that when you're grieving, you are filled with pessimism. You're not sure you'll ever be able to get out of this level, level of depression, right? Because your serotonin and your dopamine, all of those hormones have just plummeted. And so it's hard to feel good if all your feel-good hormones have plummeted, right? And not only that, things you used to enjoy doing, you get no pleasure out of anymore. Um, talking with people and a whole bunch of things, right? So that is depression. It is grief. It is very often PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, so it was Gordy who showed me a book written by the guy who knew the answer. It was Euripides, this Greek writer from the 5th century BC, a way old dude. In one of his plays, Medea, he says, what greater, what greater grief than the loss of one's native land? Okay, now this is interesting because, of course, as you know, um, our indigenous people or indigenous people all over the world have had their land kind of confiscated from them, taken away, right? Um, and then they were, of course, placed on lands that the, the conquerors had no interest in, that wasn't really very good, like, and, and put on reservations. I read that and thought, well, of course, man, we Indians have lost everything. We lost our native land. We lost our languages. We lost our songs and dances. We lost each other. We only know how to lose and be lost. And this is, this is really actually quite profound, really important, because what he's saying is every indigenous person suffers from this, all of this loss in their lives. And unfortunately, you know, there is still huge traumatic loss that is happening with the indigenous peoples. Of course, it's starting to get much better, right? As we learn and we try to incorporate like reconciliation um, and, um, and, you know, trying to move forward with love and understanding and some forgiveness. But you have to admit that this actually was true before you can forgive it, right? But it's more than that too. I mean, the thing is, Medea, the play, um, was so distraught by the world and the person in the play and felt so betrayed that she murdered her own kids. She thought the world was joyless. And after Eugene's funeral, I agreed with her. I could have easily killed myself, killed my mother and father, killed the birds, killed the trees, and killed the oxygen in the air. So he here is absolutely experiencing PTSD. Not able to even access any emotion. Feeling numb, feeling dead, feeling nothing. More than anything, I wanted to kill God. I was joyless, yeah. And if you've ever experienced any sense of depression, You'll, you'll recognize, you know, these feelings that go along with that, a numbness and a not caring. The good news is, of course, those hormones, those feel-good hormones can um, come back up. They don't have to stay depleted, right? There's lots of ways that you can do that. With some medication, sometimes you can supplement those 
um, those hormones and it'll help you feel better um, or just eating a better diet, maybe getting some exercise, hanging out with people who are positive influences for you. Lots of ways that you can get out of this kind of level of depression. But in all honesty, it sometimes takes a very, very long time, especially if you keep experiencing huge trauma over and over and over again. The point here that the author is making is don't give up. Don't give up. Eventually, you will come out of the depression if you give yourself time and have hope, right? So again, this is the absolutely true diary. He's telling the absolute truth of how he feels. He wanted to kill God. I mean, I can't even tell you how I found strength to get up every morning. And yet, every morning, I did get up and go to school. And this is interesting for me to note because as a teacher, every year I encounter students who are really struggling with um, terrible trauma in their life. And sometimes I look at them and wonder, how are you even here at school? How did you even get out of bed today? And it makes me admire and respect the strength in a lot of students who somehow make it, somehow find a way to, you know, to get to school. Not that there's any shame if you, if you can't get out of bed and you're suffering, um, but just sometimes I'm just so blown away by the strength of my students. Um, well, that's not exactly true. I was so depressed that I thought about dropping out of Reardon. I thought about going back to Well Pinnett. I blamed myself for all the deaths. I had cursed my family. What? This doesn't even make sense. But again, when you're in PTSD and depression, your thinking is not making sense. He feels like he had caused these deaths by going to the white school, by going to Reardon. That doesn't even make any sense. I had left the tribe and had broken something inside all of us. And now, and I was now being punished for that. No, my family was being punished. I was healthy and alive. Then, after my 15th or 20th missed day of school, I sat in social studies classroom, in my social studies class, classroom with Mrs. Jeremy. Okay, now here's one of our questions. What happens in Mrs. Jeremy's class? Why is this so significant to Junior? Mrs. Jeremy was an old bird who taught at Reardon for 35 years. Okay. Why did I actually miss a lot of school? Wakes and funerals? Couldn't find a ride? No money in the house? Mom wanted me to stay home because she was scared or sad or lonely, right, after losing her own mother. Mom and I had to go search for my father so we could bring him home and keep him safe. Is this, is this the absolutely true representation of what a lot of Indigenous people go through? I think it probably is. And not that other, you know, people that don't live on reservations, of course, other people go through this. It's just that Indigenous people go to it, go through it in staggering numbers. I slumped into her class and sat at the back of the room. Oh, class, she said. We have a special guest today. It's Arnold's spirit. I didn't realize you still went to the school, Mr. Spirit. All right, so right away we get some character delineation here. Um, Mrs. Jeremy, she's not nice. She may be racist or she may just not understand, right? She, maybe she doesn't have a good understanding of what he's been through or what maybe Indigenous kids go through um, daily. The classroom was quiet. They all knew my family had been living inside of a grief storm. Great imagery here, right? And had this teacher just mocked me for that? What did you just say? I asked her. You really shouldn't, shouldn't be missing class this much, she said. If I'd been stronger, I would have stood up to her. But it would be hard to do that when you're suffering from some depression and PTSD. I would have called her names. 
I would have walked across the room and slapped her, but I was too broken. Instead, it was Gordy who defended me. He stood with his textbook and dropped it. Whomp! He looked so strong. He looked like a warrior. He was protecting me, like Rowdy used to protect me. Of course, Rowdy would have thrown the book at the teacher and then punched her. Gordy showed a lot of courage in standing up to a teacher like that, and his courage inspired the others. Penelope stood and dropped her textbook, and then Roger stood and dropped his textbook. Whop! Then the other basketball players did the same. Whop, 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 whop. And Mrs. Jeremy flinched each and every time, as if she'd been kicked in the crotch. Whop, 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 whop. Then all of my classmates walked out of the room. Huge. A spontaneous demonstration. Protecting him. Of course, I probably should have walked out with them. But he's, his, he's in PTSD. He's not, he's not able to think properly. It would have been more poetic. It would have made more sense. Or perhaps my friends should have realized that they shouldn't have left behind the frickin' reason for their protest. And that thought just cracked me up. It was like my friends had walked over the backs of baby seals in order to get to the beach where they could protest against the slaughter of baby seals. Okay, so maybe it wasn't that bad, but it sure was funny. What, what are you laughing at? Mrs. Jeremy asked me. I used to think the world was, a broken, was broken down by tribes, I said, by black and white, by Indian and white, but I know that isn't true. The world is broken down, is only broken into two tribes, the people who are assholes and the people who are not. Now, I want you to listen, or, or I want you to remember this quote. It's a really, really important quote. It shows a lot of character development in Junior. He used to think the world was defined by color of skin, right? Because that had been his experience up until then. He's, he'd experienced so much racism that that was his reality. But since going to Reardon, his reality has shifted. He realizes the color of your skin has nothing to do with it. The world really is just broken down into two people, two types, people who are real jerks and people who aren't, right? Obviously here, Mrs. Jeremy fits into the jerk, yeah, the asshole category. And I agree with that, right? That, that was not called for by that teacher. I walked out of the classroom and felt like dancing and singing. It all gave me hope. It gave me a little bit of joy. And I kept trying to find the little pieces of joy in my life. That's the only way I managed to make it through all of that death and change. I made a list of the people who had given me the most joy in my life. All right, now this is one of the strategies you can use when you are suffering from depression and, and you know, some PTSD. Um, of course, go to your doctor and get some professional help. I'm certainly not a doctor and can't give you that kind of advice. But making lists and being appreciative certainly can't hurt. So these are the people who had given him the most joy in life. Rowdy, my mother, my father, my grandmother, Eugene, Coach, Roger, Gordy, Penelope, even if she only partially loves me. Then he wanted to still feel better. I made a list of the musicians who had played the most joyous music. Patsy Klein, my mother's favorite. Hank Williams, my father's favorite. Jimi Hendrix, my grandmother's favorite. Guns N' Roses, my big sister's favorite. White Stripes, my favorite. I then made a list of my favorite foods. Pizza, chocolate pudding, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, banana cream pie, fried chicken, mac and cheese, hamburgers, french fries, grapes. I made a list of my favorite books. The Grapes of Wrath, Catcher in the Rye, Fat Kid Rules the World, Tangerine, Feed, Catalyst, Invisible Man, Fool's Crow, uh, Jar of Fools. I made a list of my favorite basketball players. Dwayne Wade, Shane Battier, 
uh, Steve Nash, Ray Allen, Adam Morrison, Julius Irving, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, George Jervin, and Muggsy Bogues. I kept making list after list of things that made me feel joy. He's trying really hard to get out of his funk. And I kept drawing cartoons of things that made me uh, that made me angry, like getting all that anger out so that it's not bottled in there, right? It's really important to do that, to find a healthy way to get all that anger and sadness out and to remember to be appreciative for the things that give you joy. Sometimes when you're in a funk of depression, it's really hard to see any good. But if you really, really, really try, there's always something to be grateful for. And trying to find what makes you feel grateful can help you pull yourself out of that funk, out of that little bit of depression, or out of that big, big depression. Just little step by little step. I kept writing and rewriting, drawing and redrawing, and rethinking and revising and re-editing. It became my grieving ceremony. Yeah, trying to get that sadness out, but in a healthy way. So here's our last chap chapter in this section, In Like a Lion. I never guessed I'd be a good basketball player. I mean, I'd always loved ball, mostly because my father loved it so much and because Rowdy loved it even more. But I figured I'd always be one of those players who sat on the bench and cheered his bigger, faster, and more talented teammates to glory and or defeat. But somehow or another, as the season went on, I became a freshman starter on a varsity basketball team and sure, all my teammates were bigger and faster, but none of them could shoot like me. So even though he's not big and fast, he has his own qualities that he can be proud of. I was the hired gunfighter. Back on the res, I was a decent player, I guess. A rebounder and a guy who could run up and down the floor without tripping. But something magical happened to me when I went to Reardon. Overnight? I became a good player. I suppose it had something to do with confidence. I mean, I'd always been the lowest Indian on the reservation, totem pole. I wasn't expected to be good, so I wasn't. But in Reardon, my coach and the other players wanted me to be good. They needed me to be good. They expected me to be good. And so I became good. That's the power of having people believe in you, right? But when you are, when you come from a community that is, you know, in a grief storm, all, you know, many people suffering um, from PTSD and depression, uh, from so much trauma, it's hard to, to experience this level of support when people are, are really just doing their best to, you know, take care of themselves, right? I wanted to live up to expectations. I guess that's what it comes down to. The power of expectations. And as they expected more of me, I expected more of myself. And it just grew and grew until I was scoring 12 points a game as a freshman. Coach was thinking I'd be an all-state player in a few years. He was thinking maybe I'd play some college, some small college ball. It was crazy. How often does a reservation Indian kid hear that? How often do you hear the words Indian and college in the same sentence, yeah, especially in my family, especially in my tribe? His reserve, eh? But don't think I'm getting stuck up or anything. It's still absolutely scary to play ball, to compete, to try to win. I throw up before every game. Coach said he used to throw up before games. Kitty said... Some people need to clear the pipes before they can play. Now, I used to be a yucker. You're a yucker. Ain't nothing wrong with being a yucker. So yeah, the fact that he throws up, um, this coach is saying nothing wrong with it. Doesn't make fun of him. Doesn't call him a wuss. Nothing. So I asked dad if he used to be a yucker. What's a yucker, he said. Somebody who throws up before basketball games, I said. Why would you throw up? Because I'm nervous. You mean because you're scared? Nervous, scared, same kind of things, aren't they? Nervous means you want to play. Scared means you don't want to play. All right. So dad made it clear. I was a nervous yucker in Reardon. Back in Walpinet, 
I was a scared yucker. Nobody else on my team was a yucker. Didn't matter one way or the other, I guess. We were just a good team, period. After losing our first game to Well Pennant, we won 12 in a row. We just killed people, not literally. Winning by double figures every time. We beat our arch rivals Davenport by 33. Townspeople were starting to compare us to the great Reardon teams of the past. People were starting to compare some of our players to the great players of the past. Roger, our big man, was the new Joel, Joel Witzel. Jeff, our point guard, was the new little Larry Soliday. James, our small forward, was the new Keith Schultz. But nobody talked about me that way. I guess it was hard to compare me to players from the past. I wasn't from the town, not originally, so I would always be an outsider. And so, no matter how good I was, I would always be an Indian. And some folks just found it difficult to compare an Indian to a white guy. It wasn't racism, not exactly. It was, well, I don't know what it was. I was something different, something new. I just hope that 20 years in the future, they'd be comparing some kid to me. Yeah, you see that kid shooting reminds me so much of that Arnold spirit. Maybe that will happen. I don't know. Can an Indian have a legacy in a white town? And should a teenager be worried about his frickin' legacy anyway? Jeez, I must be an egomaniac. Somebody self-consumed, like kind of self-centered. Which he isn't, of course. Well, anyway, our record was 12 wins and one loss when we had our rematch with Well Pennant. They came to our gym, so I wasn't going to get burned at the stake. In fact, my white fans were going to cheer for me like I'm some kind of crusading warrior. So this is him in the Well Pennant gym, right? Everybody's booing him and, you know, white lover and making fun of him like he's the devil. But in the Reardon gym, people are backing him up. They are filled with hope, right? Geez, I felt like one of those Indian scouts who led the U.S. Cavalry against other Indians. But that was okay, I guess. I wanted to win. I wanted revenge. I wasn't playing for the fans. I was playing for the white people. I was playing to beat Rowdy. Yep, I wanted to embarrass my best friend. He turned into a stud on his team. He was only a freshman too, but he was averaging, he was averaging 25 points a game. I followed his progress in the sports section. He'd led the well pennant Redskins to a 13-0 record. They were the number one ranked small school in the state. Well, Pennant had never been ranked that high, and it was all because of Rowdy. We were ranked number two, so our game was a big deal, especially for a small school battle. And most especially because I was a Spokane Indian playing against his old friends and enemies, Rowdy and others who, you know, beat him up. A local news crew came out to interview me before the game. So Arnold, how does it feel to play against your former teammates? The sports guy asked me. It's kind of weird, I said. How weird? Really weird? Yep, I was scintillating. The sports guy stopped the interview. Listen, he said. I know this is a difficult thing. You're young, but maybe you could get more specific about your feelings. My feelings? I asked. Yeah, this is a major deal in your life, isn't it? Well, duh, yeah. Of course it was a major deal. It was maybe the biggest thing in my life ever. But I wasn't about to start sharing my feelings with the whole world. I wasn't going to start blubbering for the local sports guy like he was my priest or something. I had some pride, you know? I believed in my privacy. It wasn't like I'd called the guy and offered up my story, you know? And I was kind of suspicious that the white people were really interested in seeing some Indians battle each other. I think it was sort of like watching dog fighting, you know? It made me feel exposed and primitive. So, okay, the sports guy said. Are you ready to try again? Yeah, okay, let's roll. The camera guy started filming. So Arnold, the sports guy said, back in December, 
you faced your old classmates and fellow Spokane tribal members in a basketball game back on the reservation and you lost. Yeah, that, that didn't turn out so well for, um, for Junior, right? Now they're the number one ranked team in the state and they're coming to your home gym. How does that make you feel? Weird, I said. Cut, 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 the source guy said. He was mad now. Arnold, he said. Could you maybe think of a word beside weird? I thought for a bit. Hey, how about I say it makes me feel like I'd had... Uh, I'd had to grow up really fast, too fast, and then I'd come to realize that every single moment of my life is important and that every choice I make is important. Now, this is the last question where um, in our study package. What happens during the game? Why, sorry, why does Junior cry at the end? And what does he realize? So this is part of it. Um, near the end, he's going to realize a lot more. Uh, I've come to realize that every single moment of my life is important and that every choice I make is important and that a basketball game, even a game between two small schools in the middle of nowhere, can, make, can be the difference between being happy and being miserable for the rest of my life. Wow, this words I said. That's perfect. That's poetry. Let's go with that, okay? Okay, I said. Junior's just playing with me. <laughs> okay, let's roll the tape. The sports guy said again and put the microphone in my face. Arnold, he said, tonight you're going into battle against your former teammates and Spokane tribal members, the well pennant Redskins. They're the number one ranked team in the state and they beat you pretty handily back in December. Some people think they're going to blow you out of blow you out of the gym tonight. How does that make you feel? Weird, I said. Yeah, Junior's just playing with them. All right, all right. That's it, the sports guy say, said. We're out of here. Did I see something wrong? I asked. You're a little asshole, the sports guy said. Wow, are you allowed to say that to me? I'm just telling you the truth. He had a point there. He, sorry, he had a point there. I was being a jerk. And he was. He was playing with him, being a complete jerk. Listen, kid, the sports guy said. We thought this was an important story. We thought this was a story about a kid striking out on his own, about a kid being courageous, and all you want to do is give us grief. Wow, he was making me feel bad. I'm sorry, I said, I'm, I'm just a yucker. What? The source guy asked. I'm a nervous dude, I said. I, I throw up before the games. I think I'm just sort of, uh, er, metaphorically throwing up on you. I I'm sorry. The thing is, the best player in Well Pennant, Rowdy, he used to be my best friend. And now he hates me. He gave me a concussion that first game. And now I want to destroy him. I want to score 30 points on him. I want him to remember this game forever. Wow, the, the sports guy said. You're pissed. Yeah? You want me to say that stuff on camera? Are you sure you want to say that? Yeah? All right, let's go for it. They set up the camera again, and the sports guy put the microphone back in my face. Arnold, you're facing off against the number one ranked well pennant Redskins tonight, and their all-star Rowdy, who used to be your best friend back when you went to, back when you went to school on the reservation. They, pre they beat you guys pretty handily back in December, and they gave you a concussion. How does it feel to be playing them again? I feel like this is the most important night of my life, I said. I feel like I have something to prove to the people in Reardon, the people in Will Pennant, and to myself. And what do you think you have to prove, the guy asked. I have to prove that I am stronger than everybody else. I have to prove that I will never give up. I will never quit playing hard. And I don't just mean in basketball. This is an important thing that he's saying, that even though he's been through so much grief and tra trauma and tragedy, he is never going to give up, ever. I'm never going to quit living life this hard, you know? I'm never going to surrender to anybody. Never, ever, ever. How bad do you want to win? I've never wanted anything more in my life. Good luck, Arnold, 
will be watching. He's determined for sure. The gym was packed two hours before the game. 2,000 people yelling and cheering and stomping. In the locker room, we all got ready in silence. But everybody, even coach, came up to me and patted my head or shoulder or bumped fists with me or gave me a hug. They're all supportive of him. He's not, they're, they're not racist. They're not looking at him like some indigenous person or, you know, in a derogatory way. He's just a teammate. This was my game. This was my game. I mean, I was still just the second guy off the bench, uh, just the dude who provided instant offense, but it was sort of warrior stuff too. Hmm. Thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to, to, I'm going to go vomit my guts out. I am a TV star. We were all boys desperate to be men. And this game would be a huge moment in our transition. Okay, everybody, let's go over the game plan, coach said. We all walked over to the chalkboard area and sat on the folding chairs. Okay, guys, coach said, we know what these guys can do. They're averaging 80 points a game. They want to run and run and run. And when they're done running and gunning, they're going to run and gun some more. Man, that wasn't much of a pep talk. It sounded like Coach was sure we were going to lose. And I have to be honest, guys, Coach said, we can't beat these guys with our talent. What? We are just, we just aren't good enough. But I think we have bigger hearts and I think we have a secret weapon. I wondered what, I wondered if Coach had maybe hired some mafia dude to take out Rowdy. We have Arnold's spirit, Coach said. Me? I asked. Yes, you, Coach said. You're starting tonight. Really? Really? And you're gonna guard Rowdy the whole game. He's your man. You have to stop him. If you stop him, we win this game. It's the only way we're going to win this game. Wow. I was absolutely stunned. Coach wanted me to guard Rowdy. Now, okay, I was a great shooter, but I wasn't a great defense player. Not at all. There's no way I could stop Rowdy. I mean, if I had a basketball bat, sorry, a baseball bat and a, bo a bulldozer, maybe I could stop him. But without real weapons, without a pistol, a man-eating lion, and a vial of bubonic plague, I had zero chance of competing directly with Rowdy. If I guarded him, he was going to score 70 points. Coach, I said, I'm really honored by this, but I don't think I can do it. He walked over to me kneeled and pushed his forehead against mine. Our eyes were like an inch apart. I could smell the cigarettes and chocolate on his breath. You can do it, Coach said, believes in him. Oh man, that sounded just like Eugene. He always shouted that during my game, during any game I ever played. It could be like a three-legged sack race and Gene would be all drunk and stands and he'd be shouting out, Junior, you can do it. Yeah, that Eugene, he was a positive dude, even as an alcoholic who ended up getting shot in the face and killed. Jeez, what a sucky life. I was about to play the biggest basketball game of my life and all I could think about was my dad's dead best friend. So many ghosts. Yeah, he's got so many more roadblocks than any of the, any of the other boys on that team. You can do it, Coach said again. He didn't shout it. He whispered it like a prayer. And he kept whispering again. Until the prayer turned into a song. And then, for some magical reason, I believed in him. Coach had become like the priest of basketball. And I was his follower. And I was going to follow. I was going to follow him onto the court and shut down my best friend. And I hoped so. I can do it, I said to the coach, to my teammates and to the world. You can do it, coach said. I can do it, 
You can do it. I can do it. Do you understand how amazing it is to hear that from an adult? Do you know how amazing it is to hear that from anybody? It's one of the simplest sentences in the world. Just four words, but they're the four hugest words in the world when they're put together. You can do it. I can do it. Let's do it. We all screamed like maniacs as we ran out of the locker room and onto the basketball court, where 2,000 maniac fans were also screaming. The Reardon band was rocking some Led Zeppelin. And as we ran through our warm-up layup drills, I looked up into the crowd to see if my dad was in his usual place, high up in the northwest corner. And there he was. I waved at him, and he waved back. Yep, my daddy was an undependable drunk, but he'd never missed any of my organized games, concerts, plays, or picnics. He may not have loved me perfectly, but he loved me as well as he could. And this is an interesting point because it seems to suggest that he, he forgives his dad for being a drunk and he accepts him as he is, yeah, which is an important part of being happy in your life. Accepting the things you cannot change, right? My mom was sitting in her usual place on the opposite side of the court from dad. Funny how they did that. Mom always said that dad made her too nervous. Dad always said that mom made him too nervous. Penelope was yelling and screaming like crazy too. I waved at her. She blew me a kiss. Great. Now I was going to have to play the game with a boner. Again, seems, you know, somewhat inappropriate. But because this is the absolutely true diary, he's being absolutely truthful. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Well, I guess he wasn't being truthful. He's just kidding. So we ran through the layups and three-on-three -three weave drills and free throws and pick, uh, and pick and rolls. And then the evil well pen at five came running out of the visitor's locker room. Man, you never heard such booing. Our crowd was as loud as a jet. They were just pitching the well pennant players some serious crap. You want to know what it sounded like? It sounded like this. Boo! We couldn't even hear each other. I worried that all of us were going to have permanent hearing damage. I kept glancing over at Will Pennant as they ran their layup drills, and I noticed that Rowdy kept glancing over at us, at me. Rowdy and I pretended that we weren't looking at each other, but man, oh man, we were sending some serious hate signals across the gym. I mean, you have to love somebody that much to also hate them that much. Our captains, Roger and Jeff, ran out to the center circle to have the, the game talk with the refs. Then our band played the Star Spangled Banner. And then our five starters, including me, ran out to the center circle to go do battle against Well Pennant's five. Rowdy smirked at me as I took my position next to him. Wow, he said. You guys must be desperate if you're, if you're starting. I'm guarding you, I said. What? I'm guarding you tonight. You can't stop me. I've been kicking your ass for 14 years. Yeah, not tonight, I said. Tonight's my night. Rowdy just laughed. The ref threw up the opening jump ball. Our big guy, Roger, tipped it back toward our, uh, our point guard, but Rowdy was quicker. He intercepted the pass and raced toward his basket. I ran right behind him. I knew he wanted to dunk it. I knew he wanted to send a message to us. I knew he wanted to humiliate us on the opening play. And for a second, I wondered if I should just intentionally foul him and prevent him from dunking. He'd get two free throws, but those wouldn't be nearly as exciting as a dunk. But no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't foul him. That would be like giving up. So I just sped up and got ready to jump with Rowdy. I knew he'd fly into the air about five feet from the hoop. I knew he'd jump about two times higher, two feet higher than I could. So I needed to jump quicker. Timing. And Rowdy rose into the air 
and I rose with him. And then I rose above him. Yep. If I believed in magic, in ghosts, then I think I maybe was rising, rising on the shoulders of my dead grandmother and Eugene, my dad's best friend. Or maybe I was rising on my mother and father's hopes for me. I don't know what happened. But for once, and for the only time in my life, I jumped higher than Rowdy. I rose above him as he tried to dunk it. I took the ball right out of his hands. Yep, we were like 10 feet off the ground, but I was still able to reach out and steal the ball from, Row from Rowdy. Even in midair, I could see the absolute shock on Rowdy's face. He couldn't believe I was flying with him. He thought he was the only Indian Superman. I came down with the ball, spun and dribbled back toward our hoop. Rowdy, screaming with rage, was close behind me. Our crowd was insanely loud. They couldn't believe what I'd just done. I mean, sure, that kind of thing happens in the NBA and in college and in the big, uh, the big high schools, but nobody jumped like that in a small school basketball gym. Nobody blocked a shot like that. Nobody took a ball out of a guy's hands as he was just about to dunk. But I wasn't done, not by a long shot. I wanted to score. I'd taken the ball from Rowdy and now I wanted to score in his face. I wanted to absolutely demoralize him. I raced for our hoop. Rowdy was screaming behind me. My teammates told me later that I was grinning like an idiot as I flew down the court. I didn't know that. I just knew I wanted to hit a jumper in Rowdy's face. Well, I wanted to dunk on him, but I figured with the crazy adrenaline coursing through my body, I might be able to jump over the rim again. But I think part of me knew that I'd never jump like that again. I only had that one epic jump in me. I wasn't a dunker. I was a shooter. So I screeched to a stop at the three-point line and head faked. And Rowdy completely fell for it. He jumped high over me, wanting to block my shot, but I just waited for the sky to clear. As Rowdy hovered above me, as he floated away, he looked at me. I looked at him. He knew he'd blown it. He knew he'd fallen for a little head, head fake. He knew he could do nothing to stop my jumper. He was sad, man. Way sad. So guess what I did? I stuck my tongue out at him. Like I was Michael Jordan. I mocked him. And then I took my three-pointer and buried it. Just swished that sucker. And the gym exploded. People wept. Really? My dad hugged the white guy next to him. I didn't even know him. But hugged and kissed him like they were brothers, you know? My mom fainted. Really? She just leaned over a bit. Bumped against the white woman next to her. And was gone. She woke up five seconds later. People were on their feet. They were high-fiving and hugging and dancing and singing. The school band played a song. Well, the band members were all confused and excited, so they played a song, sure, but each member of the band played a different song. My coach was jumping up and down and spinning in circles. My teammates were screaming my name. Yep, all of that fuss and the score was only three to zero. But trust me, the game was over. It only took like 10 seconds to happen, but the game was already over. Really, it can happen that way. One play can determine the course of a game. One play can change your momentum forever. We beat Will Pennant by 40 points. We absolutely destroyed them. That three-pointer was the only shot I took that night. The only shot I made. Yep, I only scored three points. My lowest point total of the season. But Rowdy only scored four points. I stopped him. I held him to four points. Only two baskets. He scored on a layup in the first quarter when I tripped over my teammate's foot and fell. And he scored in the fourth quarter with only five seconds left in the game 
when he stole the ball from me and raced down for a layup. But I didn't even chase him because we were ahead by 42 points. The buzzer sounded. The game was over. We had killed the Redskins. Yep, we had humiliated them. We were dancing around the gym, laughing and screaming and chanting. My teammates mobbed me. They lifted me up on their shoulders and carried me around the gym. I looked for my mom, but she fainted again. So they'd taken her outside to get some fresh air. I looked for my dad. I thought he'd be cheering, but he wasn't. He wasn't even looking at me. He was all quiet faced as he looked at something else. So I looked at what he was looking at. It was the well pennant Redskins lined up at their end of the, of the court as they watched us celebrate our victory. So the dad is kind of feeling sorry for the well pennant Redskins. I whooped, like cheered. We had defeated the enemy. We had defeated the champions. We were David who'd thrown a stone in the brain of Goliath. And then I realized something. Now, in order to understand this next little bit, you have to understand the story of David and Goliath. David was, or sorry, David was like a little kid um, and Goliath was this huge giant that nobody could beat. And David actually threw a stone at Goliath and ended up bringing him down. So what Junior is saying here is that they were David who'd thrown a stone at Goliath the well pennant team was like the big giant. And then I realized something. I realized that my team, the Reardon Indians, was Goliath. I mean, geez, all of the seniors on our team were going to college. All of the guys on our team had their own cars. All of the guys on our team had iPods and cell phones and PSPs and three pairs of blue jeans and 10 shirts and mothers and fathers who went to church and had good jobs. So they're really privileged here. Okay, so maybe my white teammate, teammates had problems, serious problems, but none of their problems was life-threatening. But I looked over at the well pennant Redskins at Rowdy, and I knew that two or three of those Indians might not have eaten breakfast that morning. No food in the house. I knew that seven or eight of those Indians lived with drunken mothers and fathers. I knew that one of those Indians had a father who dealt crack and meth. I knew two of those Indians had fathers in prison. I knew that none of them was going to college. Not one of them. And then Sorry, and I knew that Rowdy's father was probably going to beat the crap out of him for losing this game. I suddenly wanted to apologize to Rowdy and to all the other Spokans. I was suddenly ashamed that I'd wanted so badly to take revenge on them. I was suddenly ashamed of my anger, my rage, and my pain. I jumped off my team, my white teammate's shoulders and dashed into the locker room. I ran into the bathroom, into a toilet stall and threw up. And then I wept like a baby. Coach and my teammates thought I was crying tears of happiness, but I wasn't. I was crying tears of shame. He felt ashamed that he enjoyed humiliating his, his best friend, his his old teammates. I was crying because I had broken my best friend's heart. But God has a way of making things even out, I guess. Well, Pennant never recovered from their loss to us. They only won a couple more games the rest of the season and didn't qualify for the playoffs. However, we didn't lose another game in the regular season and we were ranked number one in the state as we headed off into the playoffs. We played Almira Cooley Heartline, this tiny farm town team and they beat us when this kid named Keith hit a crazy half court shot at the buzzer. It was a big upset. We all cried in the locker room for hours. Coach cried too. I guess that's the only time 
that men and boys get to cry and not get punched in the face. Okay, so that takes us to the end of that section. Um, again, taking a look at, at the questions and doing your best to fill out the concept maps. Again, you're using eight to help you put these answers together. Answer the question by taking part of the question and putting it in your answer, providing some kind of proof. Probably the easiest proof is a quote to put in there. Um, and then an extension, some kind of explain a little more to wrap things up. All right.